Well, the uh, pastor and writer J. Vernon McGee, in his commentary on the book of Genesis, tells a story about a guy named Paul Bellamy who worked for a Cleveland newspaper. And as an editor, he would round the different uh, writers in the afternoons and evenings and make sure they're getting their work turned in on time for the next morning's newspaper. And Paul tells a story that J. Vernon McGee tells in his commentary about one reporter that was typing out what Paul called a tapeworm story, which was editor lingo for a story that was way too long and needs to be cut up and be shorter. Paul tells the reporter, cut it down. After all, the story of creation told in Genesis is only 282 words. The reporter quickly shot back to the editor and said, Yes, and I've always thought we could have saved a lot of arguments later if someone had written just another couple hundred. And as we read the, uh, the account of creation in Genesis 1, we might sometimes wish or wonder if there was more that we could learn or more we could be told. We wish it was a little longer. But at the same time, we trust God gives us what he gave us and tells us what we need to know and gives us the amount of information that we need to know to trust him and look to him. But there are times we maybe wish there was a little more information for us to read. But as we read each day of creation and progress, the days, the description of what happens on the days are starting to get a little longer, you might notice. In Genesis 1, the first day contains three verses. The second day contains three verses. The third day contains five verses. And here on day four, we get six verses telling us about what God does. So they they get a little longer as we go along. Perhaps there's more going on and needs more space, or God's just giving us more of a description of what goes on on those days. And we're studying the creation account here in Genesis 1 as part of our sermon series we're doing in May and June that we've titled, In the Beginning, We Believe. Looking at the doctrine of creation and the beginnings of the world and universe. And it's important that we study the book of Genesis, specifically chapters 1, 2, and 3, because they are important and affect the rest of the Bible. If you don't understand what Genesis 1, 2, and 3 says, the the rest of the Bible doesn't really make make much sense. If you don't understand what's in Genesis 1, 2, and 3, you don't really see the significance of the rest of Scripture. Why would the rest of Scripture be needed if we don't know what occurs in Genesis 1, 2, and 3? So last summer, we spent some time going through Genesis chapter 3. This summer, we're or beginning part of summer, before summer, we're going through Genesis 1, and Lord willing, next summer, hopefully we can spend some time in Genesis 2. And we're reading here in Genesis 1 that was written by the man named Moses that you probably know of. We know Moses wrote Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy from Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 9, tells us Moses wrote these books. And the first 11 chapters of Genesis is kind of his introduction or his background to the the patriarchs of the nation of Israel, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. But Moses gives us kind of this prehistory of Genesis chapter 1 through 11, And that's where we learn about God creating the world. And Moses is telling us this in Genesis 1 as a way to communicate with these Israelites that have just left Egypt, that are going to the promised land. He's trying to teach them who is this God that they are following out into the desert? Who is this God that has delivered them and what's their history in relation to this God? So as we've gone through Genesis 1, I've tried to give you a kind of a framework for this chapter. Chapter 1, verse 1 is that summary statement of all that happens in Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That kind of describes everything in chapter 1. Then chapter 1, verse 2 gives the background. The earth was out with, without form, was kind of this state of chaos, was covered with water. And then we get this sequence of days starting in chapter 1, verse 3. These specific steps of creation that God gives starting in chapter 1, verse 3, one day at a time. And we see in the first three days that God starts to form the earth. And then 
In days four through six, God fills the earth with life. And that's what we're going to start to look at today as day four. Now, verse 14 and 15 are our summary of day four. And then verses 16 through 18 give us more specifics about what happens. So let's read this summary in the first two verses and then look at more of the specifics in the next three verses after them. Moses writes in Genesis chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. Then God set there, said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. Now, as we look at this summary in the first two verses and then the specifics in verses 16 through 18, Moses presents to us, or perhaps God reveals to Moses, and Moses writes it down, uh, a kind of a structure that follows. We see what is created, we see where it's created, and then we're told why it's created. And what was created is there at the very beginning of verse 14. Let there be lights, it says. We'll We'll learn more about these lights in verses 16 through 18, but that's the what's created. Let there be lights. And then we read about where it's created. In the expanse of the heavens. So we can almost kind of picture ourselves as someone looking up and seeing these lights, and they appear in the heavens. But Moses also tells us why it was created. To separate the day from the night. And let them be for, that's our, our why, for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. See, regardless of maybe the time in which they were created or how long it took, these heaven luminaries were told that they, they dominate the day and they dominate the night. They were there to, to help the people know about the seasons of time and the rule of the heavens. They regulate time. Now you might wonder... We read on day one, God created light on day one, but here on day four, we read about the, the sun, the moon, and the, the stars are created. Two possible explanations for why there might appear to be a contradiction there. Maybe the sun, moon, and stars were created on day one, but they're not visible until day four. If there's a, an expanse or things in the sky, or if it's filled with moisture, maybe they don't see it until day four or perhaps god served as light on day one and he emanated light from himself and now on day four he lets the sun and the moon and the stars emanate light are two possible explanations there might be others but to be honest sometimes we just read scripture and we have to kind of say i'm not quite sure or i don't know what's going on we don't want to say that a lot but at times and i think here it's okay to to reveal that so like I shared earlier, verses 14 and 15 are kind of this general act, this general statement about what happens on day four. And then we get a longer list of specifics in verses 16 to 18 that make up that general act that's already been described. We get specifics of day four on, in verses 16 to 18. God made the two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He made the stars also. God placed them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth and to govern the day and the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. Now in these three verses, again, we follow this pattern that Moses at least is kind of following we see what is created where it's created and then why it's created and what is created he gives us a little more detail in verse 16 it says god made the two great lights the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night he made the stars also now here in this account of day four Moses does not use the usual Hebrew words for sun or moon that show up in the Hebrew language. As you notice, it just says the lesser light and the greater light. 
This possibly was an intentional distinction that Moses is trying to make here for the Israelites to show them that the sun and the moon, they are not cosmic deities worthy of reverence like the neighboring nations would practice that I'll share with you in a few minutes. Right? In other words, the sun and moon, they're not deities to worship. They are entities that God has created to serve earth and to serve the people. It's possible to see that Moses is trying to purposefully kind of disconnect Israel from all the pagan nations and their connection with worshiping the stars and the sun and the moon. And he's possibly doing that by not using the normal terms for sun and moon here. So that's what's created. And then we have, a, again, where it's created. God placed them in the expanse of the heavens. Again, we can imagine someone on earth looking up and sees them in the heavens. And then we're told, again, why they are created, but with more detail. God placed them in the expanse of the heavens, and there's these words... Uh, the word to there that indicates purpose, and it's translating the Hebrew preposition lamed that often indicates the purpose of something. God placed them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, that's their purpose, and to govern the day and the night, that's their purpose again, and to separate the light from the darkness. Those purposes of the sun and the moon, they serve a purpose for those on the earth. Again, not to be something that the people worship. And again, in verse 18, as we're kind of following these patterns we see on each day, it says God saw that it was good. He surveyed it, he reflected on it, and he remarked that it was good. It was in good harmony, it produces good things, it's conductive for life. Not good as opposed to evil, but good in, as it has a purpose. It's useful and fitting and healthy. Now again, these are created entities by God. They're not deities that God wants the people to worship. And perhaps another subtle hint that Moses doesn't want the Israelites to worship the sun and moon, we see on days one and three, God creates something and then he names it. He creates light and then names light. He creates water and names it. He creates greenery, and then he names those things. But here on day four, he doesn't name the sun or the moon or stars. On days five and six, God doesn't name things, but he does bless them after he creates the living things in the waters and the living things on land. But again, on day four, he doesn't bless either. So this could be just a stylistic variation by Moses or maybe a deliberate decision that he's making to distinguish Israel from all the pagan nations that they don't worship the sun and the moon and the stars like everyone else around them does. And this contradicted the other nations around them. The Sumerians had gods of the heavens called Enu, Enlil, and Enki, three distinct gods of the heavens they would worship. The Babylonians that lived nearby had a, a trinity of stars they called Sin, Shamash, and Ishtar. And then Egypt, the nation that Israel has just left, had gods of the heavens Nut, Shu, and Geb, and one sun god, sun god called Re that they worshipped regularly. Yet Israel is declaring otherwise. They don't have gods in the sky that emanate light that they worship. They have a God that they worship exclusively. He's the God of the sky, of the water, of the land. And as we read about this, I want to kind of bridge that cultural gap from the Israelites then to us now. See, we recognize created entities that God puts in front of us, but we don't worship them at deity, as deities. Many people in the history of the world have sought to worship the sun of the sky, but God wants us to worship him. Later in Israel, in their history, God will condemn the Babylonians because they had a group of magicians and stargazers and sorcerers, and God is going to condemn them. The pagan world regularly used the sun, moon, and stars for, for divination. Yet scripture says the sun, moon, and stars, those declare the glory of God and that they worship God. 
See, Israel, if you're familiar with the Old Testament law, they're going to use the, the sun and the moon and the seasons to tell them when to have certain festivals and feasts. But the purpose of those festivals and feasts is always to honor and worship God. The sun and the moon are created to, to serve the people and point them to the true God of heaven. And see, we recognize in a similar way, our guidance should come from the word of God, not the creation of God. Just as the, the pagan nations look to the sun gods and the moon gods and the stars and astrology to guide them, we don't look to those things as Christians to guide us. We look instead to God's word. Right In Israel, in the Old Testament, they had the priests with the umen and thumen. They had God's world re word revealed in scripture. They had priests and judges and kings and prophets and God's word that all pointed them and directed them on what to do and how to live. In a similar way, us living today, we don't have to look to the stars or astrology. We don't have to see Jesus on a piece of toast and have that affirm a decision we've been praying about, right? Sometimes Good Morning America loves to kind of make fun of us that this lady found Jesus on a piece of toast and they kind of mock us. We don't have to do those things. We have God's word and direction given to us. But you know that there's a lot of people that practice astrology and look to the stars even today. I pulled up the horoscope for a Libra, which is me, on Thursday, just to see what it would say. This is what the horoscope, according to astrology, if we follow the stars, what it was supposed to say for me on Thursday. Unexpected events may crop up and nudge you painfully, Libra. You could get the feeling that these thorns are poking out of nowhere simply to annoy you. Maintain a stable attitude and consider adding unconventional aspects to your daily routine. Today's crazy whirlwind of activity will disrupt your emotions a bit. Don't get frustrated by things you can't control. It's already a long list. Best not to dwell on it. Now, according to the horoscope, I was supposed to have a chaotic day with lots of interruptions and lots of painful things coming to me that I didn't expect. But Thursday was about as normal as a day as I've ever had. And that's the way I like it, which is good. I got up in the morning, gave my son breakfast, I came to church, typed up my sermon in the morning, did some admin work in the afternoon. Nobody called. Nobody stopped by unexpectedly. I picked my son up from school. We went home. We had dinner. It was the perfect, unpredictable day. Not according to the horoscope. It was supposed to be the complete opposite. See, we recognize our guidance. It comes from, from God and God's word. We don't have to look to the stars or the sun and the moon for guidance. Even if that's cultural then and even now for people to follow astrology. Another area I think we can bridge this cultural gap between Moses and the Israelites to us is that we worship a God that provides for us. But we don't worship what he provides for us, right? We worship a God that provides for us. We don't worship the things that he gives us. While the sun provides light and heat and the moon provides gravity and stabilizes the earth on its axis, those are celestial bodies that God created for us, right? We benefit from them, but we ultimately worship God, not the sun and the moon. Now, I don't think any of us here are sun worshipers or moon worshipers in the same category. But some of us, if not us here, we know people that are stuff worshipers. God's given us a sun and moon, but he's also given us lots of other things in our lives. And it's what we call materialism. Carrie Newhoff, who was a pastor in Canada for a long time, says, A materialist is someone who is preoccupied with the things of this world, cares too much for the things that can be purchased, spends his days dreaming only of the next acquisition, and he is frustrated if he can't get what he wants when he wants it. Now, I've lived in Alaska, California, Texas, and Washington State, four very different states. 
But there is one thing in common that I've seen in all four states. Americans, we love our stuff, right? We love our things. The Navigator's Ministry has a book on scripture memory, and in there, one of the writers says, materialism is not just mere possession of material things, but obsession with them. And two words we like as Americans are more and better, right? We want more stuff, and then once we get the stuff, then we want the the better stuff. And if you don't believe me, we can prove it by the debt that Americans have, right? According to Dave Ramsey, the average American household has $20,000 of credit card debt, $58,000 of student loan debt, and $36,000 of auto loan debt. That's not even counting a mortgage, right? We can understand a a house. We would need debt for those things. There's a house about 200 feet away from our church that's for sale for $425,000. That's probably not cash we all have. That's okay debt. But sometimes we go into debt because of our love of stuff. We worship stuff to the extent that if we don't have money to buy it, we still get it and go in debt for some of the things that we want. See, we worship the God that provides for us. We don't worship the things that he gives us. We don't worship the creation out there that we want in our lives. And there are sometimes, you know, certain circumstances where our car breaks down and we're in another state and the only way we can get our car fixed and drive back to work is to, you know, put the $3,000 repair on a credit card or maybe certain medical bills and things like that. Those are the exceptions that I'm not focusing on here. I'm talking about the desire and love for materialism and more stuff where we worship a new iPad, a new iPhone, a new iWatch, a new laptop. See, we don't worship the things that God creates, but we can use the things that God gives us to worship Him. Instead of us worshiping our things, we should use our things to worship God. Maybe it's a boat that we use to take some some kids out on a lake that don't normally get to go fishing. Maybe it's a great job where we can employ people and be a, a great example of what a faithful Christian looks like to people that have never met a Christian. Maybe it's a, an SUV that carries a lot of people that you want to use to help a, a youth ministry or a church ministry in a certain way that can't afford a, a vehicle. Maybe it's extra money you want to invest into a ministry or a local church or a large house where you want to regularly host people over or have small group Bible studies. We don't worship the things that God provides for us, but we can use the things he provides for us to worship others. So we've seen this summary of day four and then the specifics, and we get again a statement of the time on day four there in verse 19. There was evening and there was morning, a fourth day we read about. It's the same format we've seen in each day where Moses uses the Hebrew word for date, the Hebrew word yom, that whenever it's used with cardinal numbers or ordinal numbers, it refers to a a 24-hour consecutive day that he uses here. And as we read this, and as we looked at the day, day one of creation, I presented to you young earth creation, that view at the end of the sermon. And I mentioned there that there were other terms for time that Moses could have used if he wanted to say these days were epics or periods or millions or billions of years. There were other Hebrew words Moses could have used. I had made that case earlier. And in this passage, we see those terms used. In verse 14, He mentions day as well as seasons. Seasons is a longer period of time. In verse 14, he mentions years again. So we kind of almost have this image of the days being 24 literal consecutive and the days are embedded within longer periods of time and other words he could have used. It's kind of this focused seven-day creation that then lead to longer periods that occur after creation. 
And I say that because if someone ever tells you that these days in Genesis 1 are long periods of time or epics of time, they're not getting that interpretation from observing the text and interpreting it. They're bringing other aspects into Genesis to give you that position and that point of view. So as we wrap up today, I want to present to you the, uh, the view on intelligent design. You should have a, an insert there. As we've been doing each of these days of creation, I've taken a, a different way that people interpret, it, interpret Genesis 1, and I've presented that view to you. My view has been the young earth creationist position that I presented first. Today we're going to look at the intelligent design view and what they say. Intelligent design advocates that a scientific understanding of what we see requires an intelligent being as creator. In other words, there was a guiding influence over evolutionary force, not a process of random selection. They claim this is a new faith-based alternative to evolution. However, there is no specific designation to the intelligence except for what they call a creator or a god. This view is age neutral to the earth and the universe. It does not take a position on how to interpret the book of Genesis or the age of the earth. And intelligent design proponents believe there are telltale features in digital code and DNA, miniature circuits and machines and cells, as well as constants of physics, which all point to an intelligent cause. In summary, the creative action of a conscious and intelligent being is an adequate cause for the origin of the things we see, according to people that believe and follow intelligent design. Now, for each of these views, even though we might not agree with them, I'm given this, the strengths, and we're going to let them each have their day in court, but also I'm going to share the weaknesses of this view as well. The strengths of intelligent design is that there's kind of these three main arguments that they push that I've listed first. First is that DNA shows appearance of design because of the specific way that nucleotide bases are arranged in the DNA. They're arranged in an exact way that allows them to properly function. Second support for intelligent design is that genetic information shows a creator making important changes over time. In other words, there are necessary changes in genetic information that are too complex to be random. They cite an example is function proteins being developed that are normally required for life, yet it's impossible to have been the result of random development. You can see this is a very strong pro-scientific <laughs> position that intelligent design represents. The third support is chemical evolutionary theory and the origin of information shows a creative influence. A living cell, they claim, is too complex to just appear, and it must have a designer. RNA molecules are arranged in a, such a complex and complementary way that they could not have found themselves in their current form without a designer. Other strengths is it closely follows the interpretations of science, but it attributes there to be a designer for what we see, not just randomness. Another strength is there are few evidence-based objections to intelligence design, and the arguments are consistent with parts of scripture, and I've listed those there. Now let me give you some weaknesses of intelligent design, and the purpose of these little sheets I'm giving you is so you can have a way to interact with people you maybe meet with or talk to that say, I believe in intelligent design, or I believe in Christianity and intelligent design. These are supposed to help you kind of interact with these people. So here are some weaknesses of this view, in my opinion. Intelligent design proudly declares the theory is not based on the Bible, but is instead based on scientific discoveries related to intelligent causes. In other words, intelligence design is not derived from a religious text, but is an inference from science. It also, uh, their proponents might have a variety of inf interpretations of Genesis 1, or they might have none at all. They don't really interact with scripture at all. A third weakness is they must reinterpret the significance of the fall of Genesis 3, the flood, 
and sin in Romans 5. Intelligent design is not specific about the date of creation. Some people, usually atheists, will suggest that intelligent design is religion masquerading as science. Intelligent design is also too vague in its belief about a creator and a God. It doesn't attribute anything to a God of the Old Testament, to Jesus or the Holy Spirit. The Bible is usually left out of all arguments. It only focuses on origin of creation. It does not address the process of creation. And no intelligent design leaders that I'm aware of have given serious consideration or explained what God said about creation in Genesis 1, 2, or the flood or the age of the earth. And I have some further reading in case you wanted to, to read more or dig in a little bit more to intelligent design. Now, some of these views that I'm presenting to you, we would say that's kind of outside the bounds of orthodoxy, or this is outside the bounds of what you could believe and be a member of our church. And I think you would be right with intelligent design and with theistic evolution or evolutionary creation, which I presented last week. But again, it's helping you to interact with people you might meet that take different theories, or maybe you can use this as a tool when you talk to someone that's not a Christian. You can kind of use intelligent design to begin the conversation, and then you turn it back towards the Bible later on, perhaps. So let's pray together as we wrap up, and then we're going to take the Lord's Supper together. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for revealing to us about what you did and how you created the earth. Thanks for a reminder that you're in control, even if we don't understand everything. Perhaps this is one of the, one of the reasons, Lord, you give us the first chapter. We learn to, to trust you in Genesis chapter 1, just as we trust you with everything else in our lives that you are God, and if we understood everything about you, Lord, then we would be God too, but we're not. It's a reminder that we, we look to you, we trust you, and we rely on you even when we don't quite always understand everything you've given us or you tell us. Please help us to have humility as we, we study your word and interact with others. Help us to accurately look at it together and study it together. Make us better representatives of you as we interact with people that, that don't know you or are curious to learn about you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.